Hello. Yeah. So, hi guys. Mr. Gautam Bhatia is a household name in law schools across the country. And he'll be talking to us about his second book, the forthcoming book on transformative constitutionalism. So, over to you, sir. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for asking me to do this. I, I understand you've had a bit of a rough time recently and uh, congratulations to everyone for getting through it very well. Uh, so I, I don't I don't want to uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I don't want to make this uh, like a lecture. So I thought I just I just briefly address some of the the themes of the chapter and then you know open it up for discussion. As as you probably guess from from reading the chapter, it's it's the introductory chapter of the forthcoming book on the idea of the transformative constitution, uh, an idea that. You've seen expressed in some of the recent judgments of the court, most notably in Justice Chandrachud's judgment, uh, and uh, and it's an idea that seems to be gaining some kind of traction in parts of the court lately, and it, it it's therefore it, it represents a promise of a certain kind, but also danger in that, like any other phrase, if you use the word stance of the constitutionalism loosely you will end up diluting it and, and it, it will stop meaning anything, much like Article 21 doesn't really mean anything in the constitution anymore. And in fact, if you look at South Africa, where this phrase transformative constitutionalism originated, uh, there's, a critique, uh, there's, a, there's a critique over there now as well that it's become so loose, so vacuous that, sorry, is everything okay? Yeah, it becomes so loose and vacuous that any judge can make of it anything that she wants. And so it's important to, to really define this term and understand what it means for a constitution to be transformative. And in that sense, something that Granville Hobson said really makes sense. He says that uh, fundamental rights are framed against the history of fundamental wrongs. So if you want to understand the sense in which a constitution is transformative or not, then you ask yourselves, what was the situation that triggered the framing of the constitution? What was the constitution responding to? And if you ask that question, you immediately see that you end up going beyond uh, the methods of constitutional interpretation that you are normally taught in law schools. Now, I, I don't know in which years you are in, so I mean, if you have done a constitutional law course, you will know that there are rival schools of interpretation, you know, originalism, living tree, and a wide variant in between. And, uh, and all these schools of interpretation basically look at the constitutional text, they look at you know, the framing debates, uh, the structure of the constitution, and they use these tools to derive meaning uh, from the constitutional text. And that of course is, is all correct, there is no issue with that. Uh, but if you ask the question I just asked, that what was it that the constitution was responding to, then you'll, then you'll find yourselves answering that question by looking at a broader range of sources than what traditional interpretation does. And you have, in the, in, in the US, some interpreters do that. They've, they've spoken about how, for example, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech should be used to understand what the Const American constitution says about equality, race for effect. And so one fundamental objective of, of the chapter of the book and of this interpretive method I'm trying to to, um, to advance is that you, you look at the kinds of, of movements that centered around the pre-constitutional days leading up to the framing of the constitution. You ask yourself what were these movements trying to respond to? What kinds of inequalities, what kinds of unfreedoms, uh, what, what kind of equation between the individual and the state, between individuals and groups, between individual and individual, were they responding to and articulating? And how, whether and to what extent these articulations found their way into the constitution? Right? So that is, is the question you ask. And that of course takes you into the domain of history, it takes into the domain of political philosophy and law. So it requires really to be very ecumenical in my approach and it also thereby really enriches uh, 
the way that you understand constitutionalism. Right? Uh, so that's that's broadly what the objective is. Um, and in that context, if you if you look at the debates around the Indian Constitution, uh, although judges often talk about the Constitution in very progressive terms, if you look at the scholarship uh, and if you look at some of the important judgments, what you do find is a very conservative vision of the Constitution. And by conservative, I don't mean the political ideology of conservatism. I mean the idea that the Constitution was trying to actually conserve an existing status quo and making incremental reforms to it. And so the argument is that 75% of the Constitution replicates the Government of India Act of 1935. Uh, many of the more radical proposals for rights, such as a right against arbitrary research and seizure um, and other similar rights, were rejected from uh, in, in the assembly. Right? And uh, the system of government that was set up uh, by the constitution was just a continuation of the existing structures. So we borrowed what we call the Westminster system of parliamentary democracy. We borrowed that. Uh, the only difference that earlier the number of people who could vote was limited and was subject to a number of qualifications. So even before independence, Indians were voting, Indians were electing provincial legislatures, except that the right to vote was restricted and the provincial parliaments, you know, congresses had limited powers. They were subject to an overriding veto by the British regime. And that changed. So now you had like universal franchise and you had you know a genuine parliament. But the structure was concerned. And so and so therefore the argument is that when you interpret something like the right to life, when you interpret something like uh, the right against self-incrimination, when you interpret something like equality, uh, you don't think of it as being about a fundamental change from what was before. Uh, but you think of it as basically conserving say the scope with the difference that now we were independent and so we were governing ourselves. And this is not an academic debate, so it, it really plays itself out uh, in, in judgments. And, and one judgment that I've discussed later on in the book, I'll, I'll talk about it briefly, uh, is, is a line of judgment, actually not just one judgment, on self-incrimination. Article 20 clause 3 says that uh, no person shall be compelled to be a witness against himself. Uh, no person accused of, of any crime shall be uh, compelled to be a witness against himself. And uh, if you if you look at the early judgments that dealt with whether a compelled search and seizure of documents falls within um, this scope, this this clause, the famous M P Sharma case, the judgments about whether fingerprints or blood tests fall within the clause, the Katikaru judgment. In all these cases, you have the judges saying that look, we have had this system of criminal jurisprudence in the country for the last 80 years, uh, which is based on certain principles. And, and uh, if we were to to hold that the self-incrimination clause protects these kinds of, of, you know, or prohibits these kinds of, of police, uh, you know, methods as well, then we are basically appending uh, the last 80 years of, of criminal jurisprudence. Except that these judgments were given in the 50s and 60s. And the last 80 years basically was the last 80 years of colonial rule in which colonial laws were implemented by colonial approved judiciaries. Right? And so there you have a clear sense of how this entire idea that the constitution represents a continuity, a conservation at best, an incremental advance really plays out in how a court interprets fundamental rights chapter and thereby impacts the rights that we all have. And so this, this conflict over what the constitution means, uh, whether it was intended to be you know, transformative, to change something, or how transformative, how radical, uh, has a direct impact on the way that courts actually frame the rights we have. Because the rights we have are all drafted in very abstract language. You know, the right to life, personal liberty, equality, and, and you've seen, especially over the last few months, how contested these terms are. In two of the most high-profile cases, Aadhaar and Sabri Mala have had they were very strong dissents. And so you can see that judges themselves are in disagreement over how you understand the, the right fundamental rights chapter. And, and one way to, I think, really um, 
help in the understanding is to ask this question that what was the constitution responding to and what that what implications it has for 2018 the rights that we are battling all today uh, and so the objective of, of this um, book this chapter is to argue that actually if you if you look at the history around the framing of the constitution uh, you will find that contrary to dominant scholarship on the subject uh, actually the constitution was meant to be transformative and it was meant to be transformative in, in two ways. Uh, one way of course is a very intuitive way of being transformative that is that it was meant to transform a legal regime in which there was a colonial power that was ruling from top down and issuing decrees giving commands to a subject population and so that subject population now became citizens and uh, the relationship between citizens and government of course is completely different. This is meant to be a horizontal relationship where the government is accountable to citizens and that of course transforms the relationship between the individual and the state and that really goes to the rights to life, personal liberty, the rights to free speech, free association and so on. Like rights that are classically thought of as regulating the relationship uh, between the individual and the state. But if you look at things a little deeper, you find that that, that wasn't the only feature that was animating uh, the framers of the constitution. That wasn't the only concern they had. They had an equally powerful concern, which was the sense that in India, freedom and equality were not always threatened by the state. They were equally under threat by non-state parties by, and specifically by, by groups which in which uh, there was concentrated power. Now, if, if to understand this, we'll just you know, take a little excursion into, into a political theory of history. Uh, so, the reason why the default in constitutionalism is that you, you enforce rights against the state is because when the American and the French constitutions were framed and, and these two constitutions basically ushered in the modern age of constitutionalism. Uh, so when these constitutions were framed at the end of the 18th century, they were responding to a very specific understanding of sovereignty, the principle of sovereignty. The idea was that sovereignty was concentrated in the hands of the monarch, the king, the state. That was where all power was located. And therefore, to protect society and to protect individuals, you must constrain that power. So, if you look at the books of the philosophers writing them, they all visualize sovereignty as being something unified, indivisible, inherent in that one figure of the monarch or of the state. And so, you have to obviously constrain that figure because that's where the power is. Uh, now, in India, that was never the case. In India, there was this concept of what scholars call layered sovereignty, where many different groupings exercise different facets of sovereignty. And, uh, and the power of the monarch was always limited in that sense. And when the British came in, they in many ways continued that system. For example, by saying that the British government will never interfere in personal laws. Right? Now, what are personal laws? Personal laws are laws that govern things like marriage, divorce, inheritance. So basically, core civil rights, right? Your core, core issues of personal status. And they are governed by religious uh, or caste based. And I'm talking about century here, uh, the prescriptions. So the British say that look, uh, in the domain of personal laws, communities will self-regulate. Right? And so you have a situation where if you're talking about your rights in a marriage, or your rights to inheritance, or your rights to tenancy for example, back then, uh, the, the locus of authority is not the state, it's your community, religious or caste. And so uh, the understanding always was, in India that uh, the power that is located in the hands of groups is equally a matter of concern. Uh, and so unlike constitutions of that time and, and even now, uh, constitutions don't normally do this, uh, the Indian constitution has three or four very specific, very concretely framed rights that apply against other individuals and other groups. So Article 15 Clause 2. Uh, prohibits discrimination in the access to shops, 
hotels, restaurants and so on that was responding to uh, a reality in which caste-based social boycotts were prevalent. Article 17 abolishes untouchability and that doesn't really need to be explained further. Article 23 abolishes forced labour and was responding to Pegar and, and forms of forced labour that were imposed on individuals by more powerful property or land owning individuals. Um, so if you if you look at and, and this is the interesting part because we I'm sure if you if you've studied constitutional law you would have repeatedly heard about the golden triangle 14, 19, 21 the golden triangle uh, you know uh, this is the heart and the soul of the constitution and so on and that's fine there's, there's no there's no issue with that but I'd say that 15 to 17 and 23 is is equally a golden triangle that focuses on enforcing rights against parties that are not the state and and if you combine the two, to complement the two, uh, you find that that is when the, the comprehensive transformative constitutional vision comes through. And there's an interesting case that I discuss later in the book, uh, which you may have heard of. It's, it's a case called Naudi Bora case, popularly known as that, in the 1960s, where the issue was about um, the power of communities to excommunicate members, right, to basically chuck them out. And uh, the dissenting judgment in that case by Justice Sinar, which is a very powerful judgment, where he actually talks about the implications of excommunication, uh, the number of ways in which an individual is cut off from, from her society, from her cultural and social worlds, and says that this kind of, of group-based ostracism, which really impacts an individual's ability to live as a social being is the kind of practice that Article 17 was always meant to, to deal with. Right? And so then in, that's a transformative understanding. Right? You, you look at uh, the kinds of really grave injustices that were prevalent when the constitution was being framed and then you extrapolate from them. You say that look, this is the principle that was embodied and therefore when fresh injustices arise in the course of time, uh, we will apply these principles to reach them. And that gives you a sort of middle ground between you know, originalism and living tree in that you are not bound by uh, the concrete injustices that were you know, prevalent in 1947. Uh, you update constitutional meaning to deal with fresh forms of injustice. At the same time, the principles that you use are the principles that are latent in the in founding document. Right? So, so you are you're, you're anchored to the constitution by not being limited by uh, the horizon that the frame is operating with it. So that's that's an approach that I would suggest. Uh, and finally, uh, I think three important words that are in the preamble, uh, liberty, equality, fraternity, these are, these are slogans, these are banners, these are words that have been used for ages. Um, and uh, my attempt here is to, to try and give some kind of meaning to these words and especially fraternity because liberty and equality are words that you are familiar with. Uh, there is a history of, of theorizing um, for them. There are words that the courts use regularly in their judgments and so on. So, uh, and yeah, it's, it's not really difficult. I mean, liberty and the idea of freedom in the sense of you know uh, political freedom from state coercion. You see that expressed in Articles 21, 19, 20, and so on. Equality is the sense that the state must be even-handed in its treatment of people and in fact uh, not only must it treat people in a formally equal sense, that is to say that not only must it be blind to differences between people, but there are times when it must take into account uh, the fact that historically people have been unequal by virtue of their status and then to take you know, active attempts to redress that inequality. So you see that you know, the entire debate over reservations, for example, is a debate over whether and to what extent. Um, I, I, what, what I do want to say is that the task of interpreting a constitution is not, you know, a freewheeling inquiry in which judges basically, you know, go by what their sense of justice is. Uh, and that's actually what activism has come to mean in India, unfortunately, where you know you 
you have like this vision of, of a broad vision of justice and so you use the constitution to kind of implement that and that's what's given us this expansive article 21 uh, jurisprudence and so on uh, and at one point in the chapter which you may have read I in fact say that that transformative constitutionalism is not PII jurisprudence right in fact it's strongly opposed to PII jurisprudence and I, I'll give you one excellent example um, of this judicial activism right so Manitha Gandhi's case is supposed to be the high watermark of judicial activism right? it's what it's inaugurated that era of activism of PIs uh, and in an activist sense you, you you know you think that's a good judgment because it brought due process into article 21 it expanded the, the right it, it you know uh, protected people and so on except that it transformative constitutionalism as, as an interpretive approach it takes the text of the constitution very seriously and takes the framing seriously it also goes beyond that but it can't ignore those two and if you take the text seriously and the framing seriously uh, there is no way you can justify Manika Gandhi's case uh, because the text is procedure established by law and if you look at the constitutional assembly debates in every round of framing there was a very very strong debate over this clause uh, there were proponents, there were opponents, there was a fierce debate there was a bitter debate and in the end there was a vote and the vote went one way um, and so you may disagree with the vote you may think that it was thoroughly misguided uh, but what you can't deny is that everyone in the assembly constant assembly understood what the stakes were they understood what they understood the meanings of the phrases they were using now in some provisions right uh, like article 17 untouchability for example you don't get that clarity. There's a debate, but it's unclear, you know, what the consensus is. Uh, you know, there are views, and there's a kind of messy compromise happening, and finally you have a phrase that's ambiguous. And you see that in Tanshud, Justice Tanshud's Sabdimala judgment, his reading of this assembly debates on Article 17, right? Um, it's a controversial reading, and it's controversial because there is really no clarity over what the framers agreed on would be the meaning of untouchability but there is no such lack of clarity in article 21 there is, it, it's completely clear what the, what the framers were, were talking about and and they debated that and one side won and it's not for judges to rewrite that constitutional bargain uh, so in that sense transformative constitutionalism is different from activism in its Indian PIL sense in the sense that it would actually disagree with some of the foundational judgments of the PIL, you know, uh, era. So yeah, so I say that. Yeah. Sir, uh, I have one other question. So, don't you think that at some point of time, this again, that the term transformative constitutionalism, this might again lead to activism, like if, like, since the term activism itself doesn't have any confined uh, interpretation, so at one point of time, at some time, there might be misinterpretation of this term too and it might again lead to activism. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a fear that I specifically acknowledge in the chapter. I think it's the task of us lawyers, all of you who will become lawyers and some of you will become judges to ensure that doesn't happen. That's in our hands, right? Equality and liberty do not have meaning in the absence of community action and that's why fraternity assumes an important role. My question is, uh, uh, how do you crystallize that legally? How do you make fraternity legally enforceable? We understand that what you suggested is very, very relevant and an important question to ask. But uh, what's the way forward? Like you said that it's been thus far ignored. So, uh, how do you suggest that, what sort of reform would you suggest in that area? That's it. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, see, uh, I mean, reforms, obviously, that's for, for Parliament and um, I, I don't, see, I, I don't want to go into the issue of what reforms there could be. Uh, what, what I want to say is that in the Constitution, um, the principle of fraternity is represented by Articles 15, Clause 2, 17 and 23. 
uh, and uh, and in, in the book there is one section where he chooses that. So three, uh, basically, I mean, structure is that uh, three chapter, three it's nine judgments, uh, three on liberty, three on equality, three on fraternity. Uh, so I'll tell you about the fraternity judgments, and maybe that that will you know clarify what I have in mind. So the first fraternity judgment is this case called uh, IMA versus Union of India, 2011 Supreme Court, which some of you might have read. And basically, in that case, the Supreme Court held that Article 15 Clause 2 that uh, talks about non-discriminatory access to shops, hotels, and so on. The court held that the word shops includes schools. Uh, an issue was a question about access to schools, and so uh, the court says that the word shop doesn't really mean this physical shop where you like go and buy a good. The word shop is to be understood in a broader sense in the sense of a space, whether physical or otherwise, where a service is provided in exchange for consideration. And if you understand shop in that metaphorical sense, then obviously a school comes within the context of a shop and therefore the constitutional right to non-discrimination is enforceable against a private school. And the court refers to the constitutional assembly debates where Ambedkar was asked that uh, does the word shop include, say, a barber offering, you know, his services? And Ambedkar said that it definitely would. It, it means any any space where a service is offered for consideration. Right? And the barber example actually is, is not accidental. It's an example because again, uh, as part of historical inequalities uh, in India, one of you know, one of the issues always was that in the town, in the village certain basic services would not be extended to a group of people based on their caste so, and that included services of barbers. Right? Uh, and so uh, the idea behind Article 52 was that this whole sense of, of economic and social boycott right, uh, where uh, to discipline and to punish uh, and to keep in their place you know, certain castes and so on, you don't let them walk on the common village road, we don't let them draw water from the village well uh, and you don't uh, sell them goods and you don't uh, provide them services. And so if you look at uh, the 1920s, one of the strongest and most um, um, contested movements was, uh, was something called the Mahar Satyagraha which you might have come across in, in history where basically a movement led by Ambedkar in the town of Mahar, the whole purpose was that you go to the well and get water. And you might think like what's the big deal in going to a well and getting water? Well, the whole thing was that that those cars are not allowed to do that. And, uh, and so there's this uh, movement over three days where they try and they're beaten up and, and it's like uh, it's very violent and the police steps and so on. Uh, but so the idea was that, that um, you extend the right of against discrimination from the state to private parties where the uh, uh, where the issue of provision of goods and services are, uh, is, is at stake and you see it in other countries in laws so in the US you have civil rights, the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act and so on uh, where private parties cannot discriminate on grounds of race, you know, religion and so on when it comes to providing these basic services uh, in South Africa, we had apartheid where that was the whole basis, right? Um, and so, Fifteen Two responds to that reality and and tries to make uh, liberty and equality meaningful by ensuring that your exercise of your liberty and your equality rights is not meant is not met by social punishment organized by dominant groups. Right? That, that's the purpose behind Fifteen Two, and that's the interpretation that the court gives gives to it. In IMA, when it brings schools within the ambit of the Pinto, uh, 17 I talked about excommunication, right? The Audi Bora case where the, where the dissenting judgment thinks of excommunication as being as falling within Article 17. Article 23 this is a very interesting case called uh, PUDR versus Union of India, 1982, where the court basically holds that uh, the right against forced labor includes the right to a minimum wage, and the court holds that by arguing that if you think of the word forced, right, the word forced is not just when you are forced 
at the point of a gun to do X. The word force also includes uh, situations where dominant employers take advantage of of depressed demand uh, um, in uh, of a depressed economic situation where they then extort work from people at uh, minimal rates. And so the code actually extends the, the notion of, of force and freedom to include um, uh, freedom from the consequences of economic governance. Right? And so if you if you look at these, these three provisions and you read them in this fashion, uh, you get a sense of the way in which fraternity, uh, the principle of fraternity can be understood as constraining the power of dominant groups in society and in the economy uh, to impact individual freedom. So that's what I would, I would say. Uh, hi sir. Yeah. Uh, so my question is uh, actually regarding uh, what you gave us. So you forwarded the chapter one of your book that is coming out. So just wanted some clarity on one point and then uh, my question. So you uh, write that consequently in India, freedom and equality was suffocated not merely by a despotic government, but also by embodied traditional authority and domestic or religious practices. I wanted some clarity on the religious practices uh, part, and then my question also is with relate to uh, is related to Sabri Mala issue as well. So just yeah, for example, ex excommunication is, is the is the example that that I immediately give to that uh, because you have judgment on that. Right? Uh, and um, I mean, yeah, before you had the codification of the uh, Hindu personal laws. Right. There were a whole bunch of, of inequalities in uh, within like the family structures that were uh, sanctioned by the religion. Um, you continue to have stuff like triple talaq in Islam. You have I think I think in in Goa there's like I think the, the, the Christian code has had some uh, very discriminatory practices. So yeah, I mean uh, there are plenty of them, but excommunication is the is the example that you had in a time. So that that would be the best way of understanding what that is. Okay, uh, so. Uh, I think the Daudi Bora case that came in 1960s would not stand today, might not stand because of the right to privacy judgment. But uh, on the same line, sir, my question would be that as to where do you draw the line with respect to these religious practices? So now yeah. coming up on the Sabri Mala issue as well. So hmm. if you are testing it on other articles as well, for example, Chandrachur sir also, you know, uh, you know, read into Article 17 as to bring it. Uh, gender also, not just caste, and uh, read into that as well. So if you're testing your, you know, 25 and 26 on other articles as well. So as Zindu Malhotra also uh, stated that you're opening, opening uh, a floodgate sort of, you know, you'll be having a lot of uh, PILs and all of these filed on questions on, uh, you know, testing all these religious practices. So where do you draw the line when it comes to religious matters like these and the other articles that are there? Starting from triple talaq and then maybe from your yeah. Well, I mean, see, uh, that's that's a very very difficult question to to answer. Uh, last thirty or forty years, scholars have written books about how to answer that, and we're no nowhere near to an answer than we are. And so, I, I don't think I'll be able to answer you adequately, you know, in the space of a few minutes. But I'll try and. The more elaborate argument is in the book, um, and it's on my blog as well. Uh, so you could read there. Um, so I think that the balance is actually again to understand the principle for the balance. You go back to the debates, and you go back to Ambedkar, where he basically, at one point in the assembly, he says that uh, the the religious conceptions in this country are very vast. They extend from birth to death. They cover Aryan tendency, a whole bunch of things. And so I think that I am going to think that um, uh, we can't get anywhere unless we limit um, the, the reach of uh, the right to religion to that which is essentially religious. And so he's drawing a distinction between the essentially religious, so what is like core, uh, 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 you know, uh, not core, well, and what is in its essence religious vis-a-vis -vis a domain of activities that religion claims dominion over, right? but uh, 
but a consumer should not afford to give it at the minimum. Um, and it's interesting because if you, again, it, it, it's very complex in India because of our different history. So, in the West, uh, in Europe, right, uh, you had the wars of religion happening in the late 18th century. Uh, and those wars were so um, uh, violent and so uh, uh, costly that everyone realized that, look, uh, if you want to get anywhere, you have to privatize religion. Like, if you, if you depublicize it, it has to become this private matter between the individual and and God, and it just has to be kept separate. So, secularism as a concept originates from that history, that very specific history. Uh, and if you look at that history, you understand things about the the religious freedom jurisprudence in those countries. So, in 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 a situation where religion has been what they, what so thoroughly privatized, that there is actually no remaining overlap between the religious sphere and the rest of, of social life. And then it makes perfect sense to say that, look, uh, discriminatory practices within religion are to be given their, their, you know, their free play because there's a right to religious freedom which is a value and also it doesn't really impact anything else. So you have this American case where there are issues about you know, women being allowed to become pastors in the church and things like that. And there's an understanding that, um, that you know, even practices that we would think of as discriminatory normally, as long as they are confined to just, or as long as they are internal to religion, right, uh, we don't interfere, the state doesn't interfere, that it lets the religious group have its autonomy in that respect. Uh, now that approach, you can't be transplanted lock, stock and barrel into India because there has never been that clean cut separation between religion and the rest of society. There's a very interesting line by Allah Krishna Swami Ayer in the Raskin Committee where he says that, that there is no religious issue that's also not a social issue. Um, and, and so, and that's why you have this whole sense of, of you know, uh, reforming personal law and things like that. Uh, and so when you have a, a, a society where status within religion and discrimination within religion so easily spills out into other domains, uh, then you have to have a different test. And the test I propose is that what you look at is whether the practice in question right, uh, can genuinely be thought of as simply being internal to religion or whether its effect is to exclude individuals from accessing the essential social and cultural goods that are required for a free and, and dignified life. And that's sounds very abstract. I go back to Dawoodi Bora where, again, the debate between the majority and the dissent, and the majority in that case says, excommunication is an internal matter of maintaining order in the faith. Right? So, the head of, of the uh, Dawoodi Bora must be able to decide what constitutes true faith. And check out people who are not here into that. It's purely like, a religious matter between the devotees and, and, and the head. Whereas the dissent says that it's not just that. It actually has an impact on, on core civil rights and the moment it goes beyond that that domain, uh, the courts step in and apply the constitution. And so that, and, and that of course, Dawoodi Bora is a relatively you know, easy case. Sabri Mala, as, as you said, is a case that gets very, very messy. Right? Um, and, and you don't see an answer in the majority and Justice Parliament's concurrence. If you, act, I think, to understand what's at stake in Sabri Mala, you have to very carefully read Justice Malhotra's dissent and Justice Samanshu's concurrence because the real issue is in the debate between those two. Uh, and for Justice Malhotra, the issue uh, is an issue of worship. Right? So, so she says that look, this is a question about the right to worship. Uh, Every religion, every subsection of a religion, every religious group has the right to determine the conditions and the forms of worship. And so an individual can't say that I have a right to. And so uh, this gives you, and so you may disagree with it, right? Like this is not about whether you agree with them, you agree with the dissent or, uh, it's about the reasoning. The reasoning is that if you can fairly characterize a religious practice, as just being about worship, the relationship between the individual and God, uh, the right to worship, 
internal religion then you allow the religious group to you know uh, to decide for itself you you don't step in uh, whether or not it's discriminatory bad uh, stupid whatever rational irrational not your business uh, it's not even the correct frame of reference to examine that but where if, if on a fair analysis of what's happening you come to the conclusion that it's not just a religion there is something more going on that it impacts other domains then accordingly you modulate your intervention and apply the constitution oh. so but on that point my follow up question is that what would be so it would render your internal test that you said the essential test that was laid down in shirur mat then your uh, the test that you said what it should be read but then you have already you have also placed a limitation on that by stating a test as well that i think the essential test i think the essential test is completely flawed it's also it's also uh, uh, a it's i think the wrong test in the sense that if you look at the history the phrase ambedkar used was we must limit religion to that which is essentially religious now what shirur mat is not shirur mat ratilal and subsequent cases of kato is they basically do this grammatical shift they go from essentially religious to essential religious practice they completely ignored the meaning of the thing ambedkar was never saying that you that the court has to examine the question of what is essential to religion ambedkar was saying that the court has to draw the line between religion which where you give complete freedom and non religion where you apply the constitution and so i think the essentially uh, the erp test Uh, where the court has to begin by asking itself, is this practice essential to a religion? Is completely flawed and has no basis in the constitutional text or history? And the judges are in no position to to to, to do that. Uh, so I don't think judges should ever ask ask the question that is this practice essential to a religion? They should ask them uh, once it's established that, that the believers before the court sincerely hold those views. Right? You give it its sanctity. You say that this is. protected and then you ask the next question that does the constitution have said anything about it? that that's how you go that's my that and that you see that um sense coming in both the same time the concepts sir you talked about how the constitution during when it was um, made itself was supposed to be not incremental but was supposed to bring about a radical change how do you propose that the executive would have caught up with this say radical change the benefit with um, judicial review in this case would have been that the change would have been slow um taking the example of right to life it was first interpreted as just food shelter and clothing which was easy for the executive to implement then later on with like the additional judgments they were then able to implement say one right over another but at the same time if this was say right to be radical and so many actions had to be taken by the executive first of all funds and second of all the citizens themselves would not have been able to say their mindset would not have been able to keep up with such a radical change how do you propose the executive yeah. um yeah that's a, that's a very good question and uh, in fact in the chapter one point i make is that the constitution was radical but it it uh, allocated to different wings of state different responsibilities for um implementing the radical change and in fact i think that that one one reason why pil has gone so badly wrong is that it it uh, has misunderstood that allocation of responsibility uh, most most of the constitution's radical radical thrust was not meant to be uh, judicially overseen or implemented uh, the the radical bite of the constitution is in the is in part 4 the dpsc where you talk when you look at you know core transformative labor rights uh, economic transformation uh, you know and so on so actually i think 70% of the constitution's transformative agenda was never meant to to be um, uh, judicially enforced that's that's one thing uh, secondly the so on your point about capacity right my argument is that that part of the constitution is radical agenda there was meant to be enforced by the courts actually was a limited one that was entirely within the judicial domain because it was framed in the language of 
your classical rights to equality and freedom. Right? So the, the transformative part of the constitution that the courts are meant to implement doesn't deal with socio-economic rights uh, or, or you know things of that kind. It just deals with um, as three provisions, right? 15, 2, 17, 20, 23, 15, 2, right of access to uh, shops, hotels and so on, 17, untouchability and, and 23, forced labor, right? So it just, uh, the, the horizontal last part of the constitution is just about enforcing these three rights, uh, which actually the executive is in a perfectly, um, doesn't require, you know, budgetary allocations and so on. Uh, so I think that if you, if you understand uh, it in this way, that the radical part of the, of the, uh, the radical part of the constitution that was meant to be judicially enforced was basically taking our classical understanding of freedom and equality, right? Which we always have, have agreed can be enforced by courts, right? like liberty and equality in its classical sense, and just extending the reach of those principles to horizontal parties, to private parties, to uh, to groups, right? And so, if you think about it in that fashion. Um, you find that the the concern that and the executive do it right is is uh, maybe not as grave as as would be when the court takes over economic transformation. Uh, as far as the second part goes on on you know are the people ready for it? I mean I yeah I, I don't think there's really a really real answer to that. Um, as we're seeing with Saudi Malala right now, uh, there will always be pushback uh, to any radical change and I think that's a question of uh, judicial and political statesmanship if you can negotiate that change in a way that is non violent and actually achieves the goal. But I don't think that's I don't think that would be an objection to the courts interpreting the constitution in the way it's meant to be meant to be interpreted. Hello sir. So by taking example of Manika Gandhi, you said that uh, for transformative constitutionalism, uh, the provisions, the constitution has to be interpreted literally uh, and the court has to abide by the, by the provision, by the draft, it is there, already there. But after Manika Gandhi, uh, the court opened the gates for a more liberal interpretation of the constitution. So why for transformative con transformative constitutional as a concept there's uh, liberal interpretation literal interpretation is necessary doesn't it put a unnecessary burden on the parliament when the court the activism of the court is not clearly as you are saying that um, the court has to abide by the draft, the provisions, why it is necessary for co transformative constitution. The spirit of the constitution will change over time and it will be by the interpretations of the judgments only. Yeah, so I think first thing to clarify is that I don't think there exists any such thing as literal interpretation. Um, and any text expressed in language uh, has ambiguities no matter how um, how precise you make it and this is a famous example as I've forgotten which follow but uh, something as specific as um, uh, the American Constitution's provision that the president shall be 35 years of age you might think there is no room for doubt here except that you could definitely make an argument if history supported you that 35 years was not meant to be taken as, as physical age but as what was then considered to be uh, the, the age of maturity and as, as now we have a different conception of when a person matures like politically and intellectually, we can basically take 35 as, as establishing like not a rule but as a metaphor, right? And so, so I mean, so I don't, I don't think there exists such a thing as ritual interpretation uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate that even if I did. Um, no, I'm making a different point. I'm saying that, uh, that the text of the constitution um, in the context of its structure and its history, places certain constraints upon what judges can do. Right? Uh, and in a situation where the text says X, right, and it was historically understood by everyone who was involved in the debate that X and Y are mutually opposite, right? 
in that context a court can't say oh but x is y it, that it, it can't do that because uh, the task of the judiciary is to interpret not to implement okay? and when you say that x and y which the text and the history makes clear was considered to be opposite is the same then you are going beyond interpretation you are inventing stuff right? uh, and something similar with respect to uh, judicial appointments right? article 124 says that um, appointments will be made in consultation with the president to which the court in the judges cases says well actually consultation means concurrence right? and uh, again if you if you look at the way language works if you look at the history of the framing there is no way you can argue with a straight face that, consult, that uh, consultation means concurrence the, the two words are opposite in their meetings and there is nothing that suggests that, that there was ever any intention to conflict them right? and so uh, I think that, that that's what I would say I would say that it, it's not that you can literally interpret the text you are always interpreting right and, and my inter interpretations I have supported in, the, in this book and, and today that you look at shocks as you know, meaning economic actions, look at forced labor as applying both to individuals and to you know the economic structure, look at untouchability as, as extending beyond caste to gender. These are all uh, not literal, like they are really um, uh, out there interpretations of these provisions. But I think that the difference is that it's possible to defend them on uh, by carefully reading the history um, in a way that doesn't look like you're being violence to text and you're completely inverting the constitutional bargain. Uh, I think courts, when courts begin doing that, it becomes very dangerous because uh, uh, the courts draw legitimacy from the constitution, uh, they draw legitimacy from uh, uh, the authority vested to them by the constitution to interpret its provisions. It's, and so when they ignore that, uh, then you have a problem. So we will be taking up the last question of the session because the session has been so engaging that we are long past the deadline. Uh, so Banu, over to you. Hello sir, my question is a follow up to what you said about Medica Gandhi. Sir, I agree with the fact that, you know, the interpretation of procedure established by law is, you know, extended to include uh, due process of law, which essentially was not there and the drafters understood that, you know, we are deliberately not including that phrase in the constitution or article 21 that we say. But if you keep in mind the whole essence of uh, transformative constitution, constitutionalism Sorry. and treat how we, if we understand the essence of transformative constitution and transformative constitutionalism and as we understand it, uh, it has to be implemented or a great deal of pain that we are always oppressed by laws that were that did not make sense or that always took away our freedom although they were established by proceed they were proceed they were according to procedure established by law so if we see that i understand that you know the they relied on drafting committees votes and still they went on to include due process of law when it was not there but if you were to argue it with respect to transformative constitutionalism and say that if we look at the history of how this constitution has come into being or history of article 21 would we not arrive at the same conclusion that it should include a due process of law even if it's not included there did you understand the question <laughs> um yeah no i mean so right no i i, I answered the question um it's should a good i rephrase in a like in a line so i understand the means that they took they wrongly interpreted the means, but we would arrive at the same end if we were to take the means of transformative constitutionalism and reading yeah. it into Article 91. Yeah. Uh, but I think yeah, I think that, that question has to be answered in like different ways. So first of all, no, so I, I mean I, I don't think you would arrive at the same conclusion because of the fact that transformative constitutionalism, as as or at least as I personally would understand it, uh, means that the text sets like a boundary on what you can do, right? So, so unless you can defend your reading on a plausible understanding of, I mean, so okay, let me, let me rephrase this. Um, the transformative constitutionalism requires that none of these 
elements text structure history and uh, and and the social movements leading up to the constitutional framing none of these can be made irrelevant right so if your reading makes any one of these irrelevant or like um, redundant then uh, then my uh, my version of transformative constitutionalism doesn't support that you may have a different idea of transformation and that's fine uh, um, that's one thing secondly uh, okay so let's just take good this little deeper right so you're saying that you had a bunch of laws in the colonial times right uh, which took away rights uh, brutally so and and you know, really uh, messed with people and stuff and so if you think of the constitution as responding to that reality then it makes more sense to have due process in there right uh, but if, if but here's the thing right the framers were not unaware of that so they discussed exactly this this um, this issue in detail and ambedkar has this line where he says that look i have seen the the two views in the house right and and both views have their merits and look um, on the one hand there is this valid view that you don't want parliament to you know have this unchecked power to to take away life personal liberty on the other hand you have this view that in ambedkar's words five of us upheld uh, tada pota and and afspa and was parliament that ultimately allowed tada to lapse and the bill put out the other on that but yeah so basically again uh, the court says is all fine like this this gross violation of civil rights is all fine constitutional and then in response to a popular movement parliament takes action and, and, and backtracks so i think that first of all we should rethink our very intuitive but uh not necessarily always accurate assumption that the courts will be better guardians of rights than elected parliaments i think that the first of all that presumption has to be examined very carefully and 